and I'm so thankful that we can stand here and declare that we're children of God, right? So awesome. And I just want to welcome you this morning. My name is Amanda, and if you've been here for years, if this is your first time, we welcome you, and we're so thankful, and we're so glad you're here. This morning, we're going to continue in our series called Reset 2019, and last week, we started that off with Steve kicking us off with an awesome time of just being with the Lord during our message, and he encouraged us to think about what God had done in 2018, to thank him for those things, and to encourage us to tell others about him, right? And so today, Neil is going to come out, and he's going to continue in this series on just resetting for this year. So Neil, if you want to come out, I just feel led to pray for you. Is that cool? It is very cool. All right, cool. Yes. I'll always say yes. <laughs> All right. Yes, cool. Please. Awesome. Father, we just thank you for our brother, Neil. We thank you for the word that you've put in his heart and the preparation that he has taken to, to, put, this, to put this together and to, to give this to us. And Lord, I pray for each heart in this room. Yeah that it would be open and prepared to hear and to receive all that he has today. Yeah. In your name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Um, guys, I have, uh, I've joked many times at the start of a new year as I've, as I've started preaching that, that uh, the holiday season is kind of so busy with everything. You know, you have family gatherings and you have parties, there's food, there's celebration, and, and it's the time that, that Steve talked about last week that you're, you're kind of supposed to slow down and reflect on what's important, and you're really lucky if you put the right pants on, and, and, or actually put pants on and make it out of the house during the holiday season because it's so crazy, right? It's such a crazy time that for me, sometimes when I get to the new year, I kind of have this feeling like, uh, thanks, next. Do you, you guys, do you know what I'm saying? Do, do, are, are, do any of you, can any of you relate to, to, to this? Like sometimes I get to the end of the year and I just think, wow, that was awesome and it's finished and now I need a year to sleep or, or just to not really do anything, no pressure, no stress. Like, I want a stress-free zone, at least for the first few weeks. And then, just like, I like my new year, like I like my morning starting at noon. Like, like, like mornings would be way more tolerable if they all, if we just agreed to start them at noon. Sometimes I feel like, can we just skip January and February and go straight to spring? Uh, that would be awesome. Maybe that's just the way I'm wired. Uh, I, I have just a little bit of a, I just don't love January and February typically. I just don't. Maybe it's where I live, and that's my choice, and my, that's my issue, right? Um, maybe it's the way I'm wired. Um, but for the most part, I joke about these things. I don't feel quite as extreme about it as, as, I'm, as I'm saying, but this year, I kind of did. I'll be honest with you. This year, I just had that sense of, my gosh, 2018 was hard, and I really need 2019 to not be quite as hard. Just need it to be just a little bit easier. Steve talked last week about the need before looking forward uh, for us to kind of take a look back because it's always healthy to reflect, right? To take a look back and to assess things. How are we doing? How are our families doing? How are our relationships going? How are we doing in school? How is our church doing? And it's also a great way for us to really assess our own hearts and then ultimately seek to determine where God was in the good, bad, and ugly on the journey. And Steve gave us space to do that. And, and I remember, I, I know where I was sitting here, and I was sitting right next to Brandy, and, and, and Steve challenged us to just write down things that happened throughout the year, and then ne next to it, write where God met you in those places. What a great, what a beautiful, great reflective challenge. We need more time to process things in church, I think, right? I think that's a great thing. And, and, but here's what happened to me. He challenged us to do that, and I just saw, out of the corner of my eye, now I know I'm not supposed to be looking at someone else's paper, but out of the corner of my eye, I see Brandy just, just right, just, mm, just, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, 
sitting just flipping pages and writing away. I literally got transported to my social studies class in seventh and eighth grade with Mr. Short when he'd ha- hand out an essay test, and you know there was one kid every single time that before you read the fifth part of the first question, there was one kid that had done two or three pages written already, and they kind of look over at you like, oh, you're not even started? And I hadn't written a thing yet. And I sat there and I felt pressure. And I'm like, what happened in the last year? Where am I? And then I started writing events that occurred throughout the year. And, and then, I, then Steve brought up again, he's like, now, now, now look at those events and, and no matter what happened, I want you to think about where was God in those And for just a second, I felt this intense pressure. I'm a pastor, and I've been a Christian for a long time. I felt this pressure that I have to come up with where I sense God throughout the year. And I started to do the good Christian thing. And you know what that is, guys? Write BS. Right? I, started, I, I literally started to write, well, I'm pretty sure it was here, and I think maybe here, and I, I felt a twinge of the spirit here, and then I was like, all of a sudden, it was like, it just, I just kind of went cold and numb, and I looked down at things that had happened over the year, and I was like, that year sucked. <laughs> that year was hard. And listen, let me be real clear. There were blessings in the year. Coming to be a part of the Edge Church, huge blessing, highlight of my year, huge. Uh, Going to Lake Tahoe, huge blessing, beautiful time, it was amazing. But when I look back at the reality that I lost two friends to addiction, Brandy lost her first grandparent, we had a devastating medical diagnosis in my family. And, and over and over and over again, we just had family stressor to agitation to financial issue to, to more braces on more teeth than I could possibly afford, one thing after another to things breaking down and cars dying, all sorts of things that I was just like, Lord, I am just numb. And I just decided I'm just going to sit with it. I'm not going to try to do the, the super Christian thing and come up with things. I felt pressure to to write, and I'm like, no, that's ridiculous. This is a place where we can be real. This is a place where we can just be authentic about what we're actually experiencing. Because do you know that your feelings aren't bad? Do you know that it's okay to feel broken? It's okay to feel cold and numb? You you don't want to stay there. No, you you want to take steps out of that, but it's okay to feel what you feel. But it was weird and I heard those voices. Maybe you've heard them before too. As I, as I sat there and I just allowed myself to be kind of cold and numb, first voice I heard was, you've been a Christian for this long and you still struggle with that? The second one was, Are you, is it even okay that you're a pastor? Boy, those are accusing, aren't they? My guess is you've heard voices like that too. Maybe not about being a pastor. But maybe it's about being a husband. Maybe it's about being a wife. Maybe it's about how you parent. Maybe it's about something you did a few weeks ago that you're ashamed of, you're afraid people will find out about. Whatever it is, we hear these accusing voices. And I just sat with it. I just sat with it. I'm just like, Lord, I'm not really sure what to say, but you know that I'm kind of cold and numb inside right now, and I'm just being real with you. And I, I'm saying that because you know it's true already, so I'd rather just be honest with you and then let you start to deal with those things in me so I confess it to you. And I just confessed it. I said, Lord, I am cold and I'm numb. Can you guys relate to this? For the rest of the day, I wish it, I wish it immediately, I, I wish I had a 22-minute sitcom answer for you. For the rest of the day, I felt kind of unsettled and irritable. You know when something's just, there, you're just a little bit off, and you can't, you, you, you get to the point where you've been married for a while, you don't really hide it nearly as much. Like, my wife can pick up when I'm off so quickly, and we were having lunch after church, and she just goes, what's your deal? And I just go, I'm just... I'm just not feeling great. I'm just a little irritated. It's, it's something inside me. I'm not really sure what it's about. I'm not, I, I hate January. I was just really honest. I'm like, I just, I don't like the cold. I don't like being pale. 
I don't, I just don't like, I just, I, I'm unsettled. I'm irritated, so just give me grace, or maybe I should just walk away. She's like, yeah, maybe you should. <laughs> it was just hard. It was just hard. The question is, what do we do when things happen like this? What are we supposed to do? Um, how do we respond when the Christian life feels more empty than it does full? What, what do we do when our life and our theology don't seem to be in great agreement? Have you guys been there before? Have you, have, have you ever been here and you're singing songs and you're like, man, I wish I fully grabbed a hold of that. I, I wish I fully believed that in this moment. Have you ever read scripture and you're like, man, I, I see what Jesus is saying, but it's just not aligning with my reality. Have you ever done that before? And you're like, what do we do with that? What are we supposed to do with it? Here, here's the truth, guys. It's, it's more than I'd like to admit, but there are, there are plenty of times that I read the Bible, and what I read doesn't really seem like what I'm experiencing. I'm just going to be real. I'll read about things, and I'm like, I just don't get it. But I can tell you, 100% of the time when that happens, I feel awful inside. Every single time. I'm like, God, does that make me a, a, a bad Christian? Does that make me, a, am I just not able to hear from you as clearly as some do? And I don't think that's true. But those are things that I wonder. There's nothing quite like feeling like your faith is a little shaky as you start a new year, particularly when you're a pastor. And I felt that last week. But what do we do? Well, we dig into what God has to say. We do it anyway. What he has to say in his word, because when life doesn't make sense, you can try to turn to a whole lot of other things. And I've done that in the past, and the reality is I haven't found answers in all those other things. So even when I'm cold and numb, I direct my heart to do the right thing. And I jump into what God has to say. Because I ultimately believe, I know it, he still got the answers. I know it. One time after Jesus, uh, he gave a hard teaching about what it would cost his followers to actually follow him. Because we can say that we want to follow Jesus, but then the re reality of life comes, and, and, and it's always a struggle. And, and, and in this passage, Jesus equated himself uh, with bread. He was the bread of life. And he was telling his followers that we actually had to eat and drink him. In other words, you have to be all in with me. You have to be fully committed to me. And, and, and people said, this is a hard teaching. And a lot of them deserted. And he looked at his, his, his 12 original followers and he said, I've got a big question for you. John chapter 6, verses 67 and 68. He said, you don't want to leave too, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Here's the truth. No matter what I feel or what you feel about the last year, no matter what I feel or what you feel about today, no matter how numb and cold you are, there is no other way. And it might be a cold and numb journey at times, but it's the right journey. You're on the right path with Jesus. I know for me, there is no other way than, than, than through the one who calls himself the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way for me. And if you're a follower of Jesus, uh, your feelings are safe here. But guide your heart with the truth of what the word says. Um, speaking of life, um, we're going to turn to uh, John 10.10 10 today uh, because it's always mesmerized me and it's always challenged me. How about you? A lot of you guys probably know this passage. Uh, Jesus uh, said to the religious leaders of his day, he's explaining uh, the devil and how he works and he's explaining what he came to do. Uh, both forces are, are alive and active in your life. Do you know that today? We have a real spiritual battle. Uh, he said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. That's the devil's mission statement. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. 
when I read that, I'm thankful and a little bit confused. Because it's not always that I feel like I'm operating on full. How many of you guys are always full? If you raise your hand, you lie, that means you're not full. (laughs) How many of you guys are not full as often as you'd like to be? Be honest, just raise your hand if it's true. It's not always that I feel like I'm overflowing with joy and peace. Would you guys like to have a little bit more joy and peace in your lives? Okay. But Jesus said, here's the perplexing part, Jesus said that that is exactly what he came to bring to us. Do you sense a little bit of conflict between our experience and what Jesus said? What do we do with that? How often does your life truly overflow instead of feeling like your life's boat is needing to be bailed out? I think we have two possible options here when we get to this place in life. And the first one is that we can come to the conclusion that God got it wrong or that the Bible is not true or the second one is maybe, and it's going to be a harder one, maybe we can take a longer look into Scripture and address our honest fears and, 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 and ask God to, to melt the coldness and the numbness and take that away and give us, give us fresh hearts again, give us new hearts, and potentially reset our perspectives in 2019. The rest of the time we have together today, we're going to, we're going to talk about what a, a potential reset looks like, what a Jesus-focused, overflowing life looks like, and how even though we are all wired to chase after the latest, greatest things in 2019, the latest iPhone, the latest car, a brand new house, a, a brand new look, a new workout routine, uh, um, a, a macrobiotic vegan diet, whatever it is that you think is going to bring you life, maybe the answer has been in front of you the whole time. And maybe the answer has been in front of you for 2,000 years. And you've just gotten a little bit off of the path that leads you to true life, the true north. And you just need a little reset. Reset isn't as exciting necessarily as something brand new and shiny. Like when you open all the presents at Christmas and you open one after another, and and how often do you focus on the one in front of you? You don't focus very long, but I think that's what God is saying to us for this year in 2019 for our church community. I think he just wants our singular focus again. All of us have the potential of getting a little bit off of course, and we need to reset. In Jesus' most famous sermon, you guys know it, the Sermon on the Mount, he set aside the idea, he, he, he put it away, the idea that if we worry, that we can bring good things to our lives. Guys, we are, as humans, we are natural professional worriers. We worry about things that, that, that haven't happened. We worry about things that might happen but probably won't. And we worry about all these things that, that could possibly happen, and we worry about things that have happened. And Jesus said that real life is found in a very different direction. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 33, Jesus says, here's a reset. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. Guys, if we just stopped right there, that would be a really good sermon. Do not worry about your life. Jesus, uh, Xfinity wants to be paid. Um, I told my bank, I'm not going to worry about my life. And, and, and they said, I still have to pay my mortgage. <laughs> Don't worry about the braces that you have to put on your kids' teeth. Don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. 
Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, uh, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And the answer, obviously, is no. But why do we do it like it's our profession? We do it like we're paid to worry. We have sleepless nights because we're trying to figure out how we're going to make things work. (laughs) He goes on and he says, why do you worry about clothes? Uh, Jesus, because the world doesn't like us to walk out naked. See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. (laughs) Amen? Amen? It does. There's a good chance that every single one of you has, has, has read that before. And there's a good chance that like 10 or 15 people in this room could quote all of that without reading it from notes. But the question is, how many of you are actually doing it? How many of you have reprogrammed yourself to, to live by the Spirit to say, even though I feel like I need to worry about all these things, I'm going to choose not to do it. I'm going to choose to live in trust and faith that God is who he says he is and that he will accomplish what he said he will accomplish in my life. And even though it's natural for me to worry, I'm going to set that aside and I'm going to choose to walk in faith. Now, I can't see during the walk of faith, but I trust the one who does. How many of us do that? This is tough, guys. That's why we need to reset. What would it look like if we actually did this in 2019? What would it look like if we just did it and found out together how God would change us this year? What if we got to the end of the year? What would we look like? So I'm going to assume that if you're here today, that you really do want an overflowing life. Is there anybody here who would be willing to say that they're actually not interested in a better life? Anyone? Okay, thank you. That's good. So we're all kind of starting from the same point, and it's a healthy point. Uh, You don't need therapy because you answered correctly. You obviously aren't a part of the church because you want a worse life. But let me take a second to be very clear about what an overflowing life is not. An overflowing life does not mean that you have a life that does not have problems. Jesus promised that we would have those. (laughs) You're like, great, that's one I don't want to claim. But he promised that we would. Uh, It's also not a life that is guaranteed to uh, be monetarily wealthy. It's not. Jesus didn't have a place to lay his head. So we will have struggles. But it is a life. Now, make sure you get this. It is a life that guarantees that our creator is with us. And if our creator is with us, we will have peace and we will have purpose. And that should be a greater comfort for us than any of those other things that could be added to our lives. Because few things are certain and almost nothing is permanent. Have you figured that out yet? Have you been around the sun enough times to recognize that that very few things are permanent? My my grandma said to me years and years ago, and I I think all grandmas say this kind of thing, uh, years and years ago when I had, I, I, would tell, I would tell her that I had, you know, probably 50 or 75 friends. And she said, oh, honey. <laughs> she said, if you get to the end of your life and you have enough friends to fill up your hand, you've had a good life. And I was just like, I don't know why she doesn't know how to make friends. <laughs> but the reality is, she's right, because very few things are permanent. Most are just seasons. So we need to make sure that we prioritize the permanent, not the season. So how can we make sure 
that we are focused on living lives like Jesus described. We can take his word seriously and then ask God to empower us by his spirit to do it, right? Jesus had an encounter with one of the Pharisees. He, notice he had a whole lot of encounters in Scripture with Pharisees. The Pharisees were just the religious leaders of the day, but, but there was one who happened to be an attorney. And you know how fun it is to have a, a dialogue with attorneys, especially when they want to be right? Have you noticed that's not, you, you don't tend to do well in those moments uh, because they're really, really good at arguing. They know the law. Uh, so I'm sure that wasn't a whole lot of fun. Uh, he, he wanted Jesus to stumble as he spoke about what God's priorities were. Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. It says, hearing that, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, which was just another, uh, another sect uh, of Judaism, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all of your heart with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So, so what does heart, soul, and mind actually mean? Uh, it, it basically, we'll drill more into this in the weeks to come, but basically what it means is God wants a full commitment from you. He wants a full commitment. He does not want divided allegiance. He does not want you to declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and then to walk in ways that don't honor him. Does that make sense? He wants the full thing. He wants what you say to match up with how you live and, and what you think on. He wants all those things. He cares about how you act. He cares about how you use your passion. He cares about your parenting, how you relate to your friends and your family. It, it means that you will love God with how you spend your money. It, it means that you will love God with how you post on social media. It means that you will love God with how you sing and, and how you create artwork. It means that you will love God with your very being. Everything. And the second part of the great commandment, Jesus said, is just like it. Now, keep in mind, remember, the Pharisee was asking for, for, for one thing. Jesus says, no, there's actually two. And the second is just like it. But it's specifically applied to our relationships. How many of you guys know the greatest chance that, that we get to demonstrate our love for the Lord is by how we treat the people in front of us. We love God and we love people through specific focused action. Now listen, I am all for the pay it forward in the Starbucks line. All for it. Why? Because I go to Starbucks a lot and maybe you'll pay for me. <laughs> I'm all for it. But here's the reality. People that can afford a $5 latte don't need you to pay it forward to them. They don't. I believe that what Jesus says when he says, love your neighbor as yourself, I think he actually wants us to be on the lookout for people in need, not in need of a caffeine fix. Maybe it's a little bit more intentional than that. So we've got the great commandment, love God with everything in us and love people, love our neighbor as ourself. But to, to love God is to be focused on his priorities. It means setting aside some of your priorities for his big priority to shape your life. And do you know what his priority is? His priority is to bring his lost children home. That's his priority. Guys, if you had the cure for cancer and you didn't share it for the world, but you kept it to yourself, you would be considered the worst of all monsters. But we truly have something that's far greater than the cure for cancer. Every single one of us in this room who knows Jesus Christ has something far greater than the cure for cancer. We have a far more important cure. We have the cure to hopelessness. We have the cure to purposelessness. 
We have the cure to the disease of our souls, and we have the key to life that never ends. Whoa, that's gigantic. And that leads us to the Great Commission because somehow the way God thinks is that he wants to partner with us in doing this work. Don't think for a second he needs us. He could do one giant blast in the sky and make everyone tremble and say, okay, I get it. But he actually wants to partner with us because he knows that we find the most purpose when we are connected with him and what he wants to do in this world. He wants to partner with us in sharing the greatest news that has ever come. These are the last words of Jesus to all of his followers. You guys know this too, but ask God to give you new ears and and a fresh heart for it. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Steve and and band, I'm going to invite you guys back up. We believe that the secret to a full life, the secret to the overflowing life, is to prioritize the kind of living that Jesus said to do. But we can know all day what what is true in our heads and not practice it. But guys, I'm asking God for a fire, just a a fresh anointing, a fresh, fresh wind, fresh fire, for us to grab a hold of the mission that he's given us to reset in 2019 so that we can experience the kind of life that Jesus spoke about in the Bible. If your theology does not perfectly align with your life, it's maybe your life that needs to reset a bit so that we can experience all the things that God's promised because God is not a liar. What he says we will experience, I believe we can experience if we reset So what would that look like for us? To do this requires far more than willpower, doesn't it? Because how many of you have already screwed up your resolutions about working out in 2019? We don't tend to be really good at resolutions, do we? But it requires an empowering of God's Spirit. We need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. It requires walking in faith when you don't see it, when you don't feel it, when you don't want to and trusting that God is going to meet us there. It also requires a tremendous amount of grace from God uh, because you're going to fall down, you're not going to do this perfectly, and and you're, you're never going to do it perfectly on this side of eternity. It's okay. It's okay when you fall. God knows that we're all weak, we're all made of clay, but he wants to use us anyway. Isn't that good news? His essence is grace, and his message to us is love. As we get ready to close, I want to ask you two questions, and here's the first. Will you trust your feelings from the end of 2018 and maybe how you feel this morning, or will you dare to believe that God has more for you this year? If you'll dare to believe and act on it. I invite you to stand up right now. Don't think about it. Just stand up if you want more. Just stand up. Just get up right where you are. If you don't have an overflowing life and you're like, God, I'm going to dare to believe that you're going to bring an overflowing life, just stand up. Don't do it unless you really mean it. If you know right now, it's okay. Be honest. If you're just cold and numb and you're like, none of this is connecting with me, sit where you are because let the fire of the people standing Let that fire spread to you. I'm confident it will. Just be honest. Here's the second question. Guys, stay standing. Have you submitted your life to Jesus? Have you submitted your life to Jesus? If you haven't and you want to reset your entire life today, I want to ask you to stand up too. Maybe maybe some of you haven't and you're standing. That's okay. Not going to point you out. 
But the Bible says for us to spiritually reset, it's very simple, but it takes humility. And, and it says to repent, it means to have a change of mind that leads to a change of heart and a change of steps. It means saying, God, I, I've done it all wrong. I know it. Nothing I do seems to work. And I need you to come into my life and to change me. Forgive me of my sins. That's repentance. And it says, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That's publicly identifying with Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And you're saying, no matter what happens, I'm not going back. If I have to limp across the line into eternity, that's better than thriving on this earth. Amen? That's all we have to do. And at that point, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and we're forever forgiven. Who needs to be forgiven forever today? Let's pray. God, I believe that all of us need to reset something in our lives in 2019. And I pray that no matter what things that we commit to changing, no matter what diet plans we do, no matter how we change our eating or how we increase our exercise or how we uh, take steps to have better marriages, Lord, all those things are good. But we want to be focused on the best thing. And you say that if we will prioritize your kingdom, if we will put your values in place of our values, that you will add all of those things that we need in our lives, all the things that we spend time chasing after, you will add those to us. So today, we stand on that and we ask you to empower us by your Holy Spirit. And we pray that you would give us strength and give us your grace as we stumble around trying to figure this out, God. But help us to stay on your course and help us to put these two things before us every single day. The great commandment and the great commission. Lord, uh, remind us of it. Uh, Haunt us with it. Whatever it takes, Lord, help us to be fully dedicated to your purpose. And I pray that we would have testimony of overflowing life that comes from a refocus and a reset in 2019. God, bring your truth. Bring your change. We submit to you. And Father, if there is anybody here who has made you their Lord for the first time today, God, we know that heaven celebrates and we celebrate with them. God, thank you for them. God, we pray that you would seal all of this in the way that only you can by your Holy Spirit. And we receive all of that change. God, help us to look forward to every single thing that happens this year, even the hard things, because we are living on purpose as we are reset, as we are refocused, as we are more focused on what you want to do in us than what we wanted to do before. God, we love you and we worship you. in the name of the one who makes all things new, we pray.